Now, speaking about the last point that uh, Bryce left on was about uh, the speech that uh, President Putin delivered just a couple of days ago. We're going to pick up um, on that with our next guest for today. Michael Tracy, who's a journalist, is with us on the line from the United States. Michael, good afternoon. Peace upon you and welcome to The Draft Time Show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, what are your thoughts on the speeches this week from, from both sides, maybe? Well, I think there were re- reinforcements of a long-standing dynamic where both sides, and not necessarily to equate both sides in any kind of moral or strategic sense, but both sides are willfully raising at least what they claim are the stakes of the conflict. I think Putin himself said that the conflict is existential for Russia itself. Hmm meaning that Russia's war in Ukraine bears directly on Russia's continued existence as a state, and it needs to prevail in order to preserve its own, again, continued existence. And Biden, likewise, in going to Kyiv himself, affirms some of these maximalist ideological commitments to the war that he's espoused now for the entirety of the conflict, but which he's continuing to maintain the fervor of in declaring and whether you disagree or agree with this prognosis i don't have much reason to doubt that it's a sincerity it's a sincere reflection of biden's actual beliefs for better or worse Hmm. but he more or less has proclaimed that the conflict is this cosmic struggle between more or less good and evil and at the very least as he puts it it's the focal point for the to the preservation of democracy, meaning democracy itself, is at stake in Ukraine. Um, so these are irreconcilably maximalist beliefs as to what the meaning of the conflict is, right? Hmm. And I think that goes at least part of the way in explaining why there's no movement whatsoever that we can see anyway in the public record towards some sort of conciliatory or diplomatic approach to resolving the conflict. Rather, it seems to be trending in the opposite direction where, um, you know, total victory of some sort seems to be what people are at least proffering as their only um, acceptable outcome for either side. Michael, you're a roving journalist. You've, you're, you're, um, I I follow you on Twitter and, and I see, um, you you making waves in a, <laughs> in in a lot of uh, in a lot of your colleagues uh, um um you know um not on the, on the positive side one thing you mentioned just yeah. now <laughs> one thing you mentioned about biden genuinely thinking this is about good and evil yet over a, over the past couple of years it was the west who were um uh, who were reporting about Ukraine being fertile ground for far right nationalism um, because they were surrounded by there was Poland there there was Viktor Orban in Hungary there was uh, um, a lot of people with that ideology of far right extremism were kind of um, being trained or or reportedly being trained and you know mainstream newspapers were covering those so. What's happened in the past year or two years that the the journalistic fraternity has kind of forgotten that they were the ones who were reporting the total opposite of what they're saying now? Yeah, you know, it's amazing how seamlessly that narrative was turned on its head and nobody even seemed to pause and notice or at least sort of attempt to us out how it is that such um, such a swift and decisive narrative switch could be executed and everybody just kind of assumes that that's the law of nature or something it wasn't even it wasn't even the media so much that shifted well I, sh- I should rephrase yes you're right that the purported prevalence of this far right sentiment in Ukraine was widely reported on the media. But even look at the U.S. Congress. There was a letter that was organized in 2018 by Ro Khanna, the Democratic 
congressman from California who then co-chaired the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign, where he was complaining about, and I think about 40 of his Democratic colleagues signed on to this letter. It was addressed to the State Department. He was complaining that the Ukraine government was engaged in state-sanctioned Nazi, quote, glorification. That was his words. Hmm. And this was a concern that was being emphasized by the more progressive, quote-unquote, element of the Democratic caucus vis-a-vis Ukraine, because the idea was to exert greater oversight over to whom U.S. resources were being dispatched in Ukraine, and the idea was they didn't want to embolden or, or bolster or provide uh, material support to any sort of fascistic or Nazi-aligned uh, element in Ukraine. And you know, that was, that's in the record. And then they all of a sudden turned on a dime and insisted that any reference to any of this was simple propagation of Russian disinformation, right, or an, an attempt to aid Russia's justification for its uh, war effort. So really what happened was the prerogatives of accurately reflecting the truth or conveying reality got subordinated to the prerogative of opposing Russia and supporting Ukraine, which even if you think it's justified to support Ukraine or oppose Russia, it's ultimate, ultimately a propagandistic purpose, right? Because you're either supporting or opposing the war aims of a particular warring party. Um, in, a, in an act of conflict. And so that, that's, that's, I think, the kind of uh, essential explanation for, for what happened there, the, the, the way that these you know, imperatives got, uh, got flipped and guided you, the analysis. You, you've, been, you, you've been appearing on different uh, channels around the world um, in, in uh, you know, Middle East and uh, Israel and in America, even Fox News. With yeah. with uh, you know, everyone giving a different narrative, um, everyone talking about Putin. Nobody is willing to talk about what should Putin do if NATO build uh, or stock their arsenal in Poland. Nobody talks about. Nobody is even willing to go, um, uh, go down that route that. If they were in Putin's shoes, would they allow, um, you know, such weaponry to be on your borders? What? Why is that? N- nobody's willing to talk about NATO's responsibility. Right. right. Well, because they think that, meaning U.S. slash Western media, tend to think that that's an attempt to propagandistically deflect uh, the assignment of blame from where it should be rightly assigned, which is Putin. And they think that any uh, self-scrutiny or, or introspection as to the potential culpability of the um, U.S. or NATO or what have you, that's all, again, in service of supporting the propaganda objectives of, of Putin and therefore intolerable. You know, it's funny, you're right, I have been on a wide variety of media over the <laughs> course of the I'm glad, the I, re- I'm glad <laughs> I reminded you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and it's funny because like, uh, when I've been on Indian media, I had a, right. a, a Chinese inquiry and stuff, yeah. and on those forums, there is more interest in the main in discussing like the policy response of the U.S. NATO from a kind of skeptical or at least just a journalistic perspective, then there would be anything close to like an appetite for within the U.S. media because in the U.S. media it's you know all Putin all the time and always about kind of fervent denunciation as though that's the be all end all of how one can make an assessment of the conflict right it's kind of almost childish and that's the only sort of they're like a one trick pony and that that that's the only sort of uh, way that they know to approach the issue, just denouncing over and over again, as though that makes any difference. Well, the, the, um, reason, the reason I asked about the, the, the international presence of, of you being on media is because the West keep on, or the Western media keeps on talking about how the world is against Putin. Mm. That's not right. the case, is it? I mean, it's only the Western developed world, because Africa, Asia, South America, um, they, they're... They're either for 
or neutral to Putin. Right. So, so, so this right. this, even, this 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 narrative of the world is against uh, uh, Putin is is incorrect, is it not? Right, and even countries that are ostensibly within the direct orbit of like the Western security order, and I hate using that term or terms like it because they're so cliched and <laughs> annoying, but I'm just saying it for simplicity's sake. Even countries that are supposed to be within like that direct orbit of, in particular, the United States, have not aligned with the United States um, policy or acceded to its demands in terms of how they should respond to the Ukraine situation. And that includes even you know Israel, Saudi Arabia, um, Hungary, which is a NATO member, uh, member state, Turkey, another NATO member state, not just any NATO member state, but the state with the second largest military within NATO, yep. um, a, a fairly drastically different position uh, it takes than the United States. Um, so, yeah, on, you have those, you know, UAE, um, Qatar, et cetera, uh, similar story. Uh, so those, those, and those states are space, basically supposed to be um, aligned with the general strategic interest of the United States, or at least that's what we're generally told. Um, so, yeah, you have that, but then you also have the countries with the, that comprise the lion's share of the world's population. I mean, it's funny. Uh, Biden goes to Kiev this week, makes all these grandiose proclamations about how freedom as we know it hinges on the ability of Ukraine to achieve a military victory in the Donbass and in like Zaporizhia, right? Uh, and, you know, again, this is all in the name of this noble attempt to ensure that future generations could enjoy the fruits of democracy. And it turns out that the position of the world's largest democracy or the country that's like reputed to be the world's largest democracy, India, hasn't changed at all. I mean, even just yesterday, they continued to abstain and the uh, UN vote on um, condemning Russia and calling for an immediate withdrawal by Russia from from Ukraine. So, yeah, the, 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 the highfalutin rhetoric um, maybe sounds self-flattering to a lot of the people who engage in it, but it doesn't actually accord with um, the reality of, of, of actual international international public opinion, at least as far as we can best um, ascertain. Finally, Michael, um, I don't want our listener to think we're talking pro-Russia, pro-Ukraine. One of the reasons we're discussing today this, this conflict is no one seems to be looking at middle ground. No one seems to be thinking, well, okay, Russia did wrongfully, for whatever reason, wage war on Ukraine. Instead of, you know, the, the as Bryce Green said, you know, the, you know, where's the elders? Where's the grown-ups? As grown-ups, somebody to say, okay, find middle ground. There needs to be peace. There needs to be middle ground here. We cannot be escalating this. That seems to be missing completely from this conflict. There's no middle ground. You're either with us or you're against us. Where do you think, are we, where, where are we heading? Are we heading through dangerous times or is this just rhetoric? Well, I think a key feature of how the public discourse around this conflict has, um, has presented itself is that there's this constant expectation or this constant requirement imposed that to talk about the war, one must always be in this mode of uh, moralizing, meaning that if you're not always denouncing Russia and valorizing Ukraine, then you're under suspicion. And so most of the time, people hew to that line. Uh, Because you don't want to risk professional consequences or social consequences of appearing to be uh, sympathetic to Russia. And those consequences are actually real for uh, a lot of people, depending on what their kind of station in life is. So they hedge um, pretty significantly in what they're willing to say. Um, and, and, and that's really a... That's, that's such a sad state of thing affairs. To have imposed on, and that's, it's so distorting because in order to rationally analyze uh, an event as multifaceted and fraught and um, grave in, in terms of its potential um, uh, danger that it poses. You, you have to kind of 
step back from that hyper moralizing frame of reference and actually try to do a bit more of a detached, dispassionate evaluation every now and then. And but that's you know forbidden for the most part within sort of mainstream circles. Mm. Um, and so you don't really have it ever explained in public venues or in public forums in the United States that what the U.S. policy has been geared intractably toward uh, since the war started was incremental escalation of the warfare. I mean, that was the point in why the U.S. has sent higher and higher grade weaponry every couple of weeks or months. Um, the, the intent of that policy was so that Ukraine would be able to wage more intense and effective warfare and even expand the um, uh, expand the domain of the war fighting hmm. so but but that's not really c- clearly communicated to most audiences so they think that the only culpable party in any kind of ex- uh, escalation is russia because russia's bad and that the o- only the bad actor could be responsible for escalating hmm. which is just not true in just a, just a very sort of baseline almost uh, banal sense in that you know it takes two to tango for an escalatory spiral to be carried out Right, so if it, there's a tit for tat escalation, um, which there has been with like the U.S. and the, uh, Russia kind of uh, countering one another and acting in accordance with what what what, what each other does, um, that that's the that's the fundamental dynamic at play here. And so there's no critical scrutiny placed on to what extent the United States has contributed to this situation that we find ourselves in now. Where at least if you listen to what the public allegations are, they're now saying more or less, that China is plotting to enter the war, more or less, as a co-belligerent alongside Russia, mm-hmm. which is what, like an astounding development, potentially, if you want to stipulate that it's true, because it would broaden the contours of the war into so- something resembling a bonafide world war. And if that's now the point we, you've, we've reached, um, then that's nothing if not an, excla- uh, an escalation. But people don't. People uh, haven't been communicated with the details and the, the knowledge required to understand how that escalatory spiral actually progressed into what what uh, role the the United States in particular played in in accelerating it, which I think is dangerous. And so we, just, when you ask where does this lead to or what's going to happen, um, I've learned uh, that it's a folly. Um, to make firm predictions about something as sort of inherently unpredictable and chaotic as war, mm-hmm. um, which is a phenomenon unlike any other in that regard. So I wouldn't make any firm predictions because, you know, who knows? It's, it's impossible to say. All I can really do is look at what the facts show now and what can be empirically ascertained now. And what, can, what the, the facts and empirical data show is a logic of escalation embedded in the policy of the United States and also seemingly of Russia, um, at least of, to some degree, that has led to what these mutually irreconcilable warring parties going, uh, drifting further and further away from any sort of mutually agreeable settlement. And China put out what it has called some sort of peace proposal or at least statement of the position on Ukraine. And it's uh, consistent with what China's been advocating this entire time. And this has never even given an airing in at least. I was going to say that. I was going to say that, that China, China's, uh, uh, you know, uh, intervention has kind of been ignored, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is sad and bizarre considering um, the role um, China um, can play in ending uh, this, uh, this, this conflict. Uh, Michael, um, we're we're coming up to to the hour. I just want to thank you for taking time out and coming on to uh, the Drive Time Show on Voice of Islam. I look forward to your tweet about the easiest interview <laughs> you've ever done, <laughs> and, and uh, I wish you a fantastic. Yeah, you, uh... I wish no, you a nice fun. change of pace where I don't feel like I've been bloodied and battered. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you a fantastic weekend ahead. May peace be with you. All right, you too. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.